Brown Consulting's Case Scope 16 on Core Presentation of Testing, Reconciling, and Validating Less Pain and More Gains. Today's presenter is Ron Moore. Ron, Ron's presentation will run about 40 minutes. You can ask questions anytime during the presentation by typing them in the question box on the right panel of your screen. When the presentation is finished, Ron will read off the questions and answer them. And with that, I will turn things over to Ron. Thanks, Shana. Um, so um, as Shana said, um, I'm Ron Moore, a solutions architect with, with TopDown. Um, I've been doing uh, SBase for a very long time, since the very beginning, um, and uh, planning as it um, entered the scene. Um, this presentation is called uh, Less Pain and More Gain, and a lot of the techniques that we're about to see, um, I learned the, the painful way, um, and uh, validation and testing um, uh, can be a pretty um, tedious um, task, and the way that we maintain quality and keep our testing and validation uh, as thorough as possible is to uh, automate and have a set of best practices that we can repeat that um, save us time and give us um, as thorough a result as possible. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this presentation. Many of these tasks or many of these techniques are very simple and you probably know about them and have, have used them. What I'm going to try to do is show you some tips and a um, little bit more advanced techniques that you can easily apply to add a lot more power and save you um, a whole lot of time. So first, some principles. Um, testing is all about comparison, comparing what you've got in your system to what's supposed to be in your system. So uh, a couple of buzzwords, I use the word test to refer to the data that you're working on or the system that you're working on, and I use the word control to mean the blessed, uh, validated, correct uh, target data. Now that control data may not actually be right. You can certainly hope it is. But um, that's what you're comparing to. So uh, a comparison against the control data is, um, is really uh, principle number one. Um, testing at every stage. Uh, I'm a big believer in testing as you go. Um, you don't want to make three or four or five changes and then test because Simply speaking, you don't know which of those three or four or five changes um, created the new result or, or why the results are different, um, which of those changes made those results different. So testing at every stage is critical. Regression versus non-regression. Well, regression testing, of course, is um, this used to be right. I made some changes. Now I need to do regression testing to make sure that the changes that I made didn't break something that was correct before. And non-regression testing is just the other kind of changes. Testing for the, um, the changes that you're most, re uh, testing for the results, most recent changes created. And both of them are critical. And at the beginning of the project, you have very little regression testing to do and mostly non-regression testing to do. Toward the end of the project, you have mostly regression testing to do and perhaps very little non-regression testing. So the regression testing builds up over time and gets to be more and more onerous over time. So um, saving your test results over time and being able to repeat those and make sure you get the same results again can really save you time as you go through the process. So the idea of, of um, running a test and saving that, for example, Excel workbook so that you can run that test again is going to save you time. Um, during development and ongoing, um, of course you need to test while you're building this thing, 
but then many of these tests will be necessary while this thing is in production. Uh, we had an example, we had a very tricky aggregation um, a project I did last year. We had about um, a dozen or so uh, worldwide um, uh, Microsoft SQL GL instances. Um, we were aggregating those or the, the customer was aggregating those into a single staging area and it was a communication heavy uh, job and the communications from some of the outlying parts of the world were not necessarily uh, very stable and reliable. So um, as we were doing the development we were arguing for aggressive testing of our source data to make sure that the staging data agreed with the um, dozen or so GLs um, but that same sort of testing was going to need to go on, um, on an ongoing basis because the finance people needed to be able to rely on those results every morning when they walked in and uh, with a communication intensive system like this uh, there's every chance that you're going to experience problems so some of the, t the testing that you set up during development will be extremely useful uh, for ongoing testing Testing in character, I um, had an example from earlier this year, we were doing a driver-based budgeting application in PBCS and um, testing your budgeting process in a new system um, is a lot of work. Um, so how are you going to be sure that all of these pieces work unless you really test just exactly like the user? Um, so we started doing what we called dry runs, which was um, trying to sit down from scratch, create a new budget from the beginning through to the end and through to the reports. Um, and that enabled us to get the order of data loads, et cetera, correct so that um, and um, what data needed to be loaded when, et cetera, in in character, exactly like end users. You're not going to be able to achieve that perfectly, but the more you try to do that, the better. And make it self-documenting. Um, nothing's less fun for developers than writing documentation. Developers like to make new stuff, write new scripts, see new numbers, um, and documenting that is um, not the most fun part of the task. Um, so we need processes that are self-documenting so we capture uh, this validation documentation as we go. And prioritize. Um, you know, unless you test every single number, you haven't tested thoroughly. But you're never going to have time to test every single number. So you have to do tests that give you the biggest bang for the buck. So a little bit more on control data. Okay, so this is the target data. It's the validated, blessed, so-called correct data that you're uh, comparing to. Um, if, you've, if you're doing a conversion or a modification, let's say you've got an S-based database and you're optimizing it. Well, the numbers shouldn't change, right? So you've already got your co perfect control data. If you're converting an old system, you probably have control data that's at least mostly correct. Um, so that, that's the lucky situation. Um, what if you don't have it? It's a brand new system and, and these numbers have never been calculated before or they haven't been calculated in very comparable ways. Well, I think it's important to have it created. Um, one of the things that, when, when I'm doing estimates, one of the questions that I ask is, what's the control data? What are we comparing to? And if they say, well, we don't really have any, the estimate goes up because it's going to take a much longer period of time to, to test and validate. Um, if we've got something that we can compare to, then we're going to know when it's right. If we don't have it, um, we should get the users to create it. And um, generally, that's in Excel. Um, uh, create uh, some samples of the reports that you want out, uh, create an input set of data 
um, put all the calculations in Excel and that'll create an output set of data. So you've got the input data, you've got the output data, and you've got all the logic in between spelled out in a way that um, developers can read and is very specific. There's no fuzz or there's much less fuzz around how things should be calculated. So it forces the users to clearly specify the logic as well as giving you some target data. Now, it, this is a big job, nobody wants to do it, um, but it will uh, pay big dividends in testing uh, compared to the amount of time it, it takes to do it. Um, so the process of having control data uh, makes testing uh, faster and easier and documented because now you can create difference sheets and difference workbooks that document each test that you do. Uh, consider control data for non-standard non inputs. So for example, if, what, if, what if the inputs are zero? What if they're negative? What if they're blanks? Um, an example uh, we had in the driver-based budgeting model that I spoke about a little bit earlier, um, you might not anticipate negative revenue. But probably the company as a whole doesn't have negative revenue. But when you go into, let's just say, 100 business units by month, revenue may be pretty thin in some of those business units. And particularly in a highly seasonal business, which this was, um, there could be months where down in the depths of the lower level business units, there is no revenue or very little revenue. So all you need is one big credit to create negative revenue. And we had exactly that. So, um, and there were some interesting ramifications of dealing with negative revenue. But that's something that needs to be tested for. And so you're going to organize this control data into um, Excel workbooks, or Excel worksheets that are S-base friendly. And by that, I mean they look like an S-base query with you know, row dimensions and column dimensions and um, page dimensions. So an example of testing every stage, that um, complex aggregation that I, this is for a drill through project. Um, so the data comes from about a dozen GLs into a staging area, which was to aggregate the GLs. And then from that staging area, it went to what we call an FDR, a financial data repository. And an FDR to us is uh, really a star schema that's been enhanced to provide a lot of information that SBase needs. It's got hierarchies, it's got um, SBase properties, etc. cetera. Uh, it may have active, inactive flags. Um, so we've enhanced that star schema. Um, and then it went from the FDR into SBase using SBase Studio. And then from the SBase data, uh, we were doing drill through reports and we wanted to be able to validate the result of the drill through report against the SBase data. So coming from the GLs to the staging area, we could do checksums. And a checksum um, is just add up all the numbers. Now that may make no sense financially, but if you add up all the numbers in one location and you add up all the numbers in the other location, they ought to come out to the same thing. So uh, regardless of whether it makes financial sense, it's one very uh, high level, simple test. Um, it's easy to do in most situations and um, uh, so it's a great summary test. Uh, we could also do pivot tables. We could do pivot tables against the individual GL uh, um, tables. We could do pivot tables against the staging table, and then we can do checksums by category. So we can start to break it down and see where the errors are. Oh, it's in the, um, um, uh, the uh, Latin America uh, GL versus being in the Europe GL. So we can start to trace our errors. So it's, it's one thing to identify that there are errors. The checksums are different. The next step is to diagnose where those errors are because that helps you fix them faster. 
Okay, going from staging to FDR, again, we can do pivot tables and checksums. Um, when we go from the FDR to SBase, now one of those data sets is in a relational database and one of them is in SBase. So, of course, we can do um, drill downs in SBase and we can do pivot tables that look somewhat similar to those SBase drill downs and we can start to do differences uh, across those. So it's, um, there's some mapping to do, but um, we can do direct comparisons of the S-base data to the uh, relational data. Then when we go from S-base to the drill through reports, we're looking at um, aggregated data in S-base and granular data in the drill through report. So the big deal there is to make sure that the drill through report adds up to the total that you see in SBase, that the individual records are correctly adding up to the total. Um, this, this was a complex round trip. We weren't drilling through to the fact table that built the SBase database. Uh, we were drilling through to um, GL records um, that had been mapped through HFM and so um, we did some complex work to reverse the uh, FDM and um, DRM mappings. So this was a lot more complex than usual and required a lot more testing. Now, of course, there are thousands and thousands of, probably tens of thousands of intersections that you would be producing drill through reports on. So um, I wrote a macro to launch uh, hundreds of drills at a time um, and uh, capture statistics and, and checksums from those drill through reports and compare them back to the data in SBase. And so this made it possible to do um, uh, massive testing on the uh, drill through reports. Testing calculations. First, test at level zero, then test your aggregations. Most of the complex math is in your level zero calculations. Um, and so you need to get that right first. Um, then test the aggregations. Don't try to do them at the same time because the aggregation math is fundamentally different than the level zero math. Test as you go, not all at once. Uh, when I used to teach boot camps, there, there used to be a big case study on Friday where um, people would take two or three hours to complete this one big case study exercise. I'm sure that's burned in a lot of your brains from actually going through that. And I would see that some people would type in a lot of lines of code and then try to test. I, I, I try and dissuade people from that. I recommend you type in one line of code, test it. Type in the next line of code, test it. Type, type in the next line of code, test it. Um, because if you type in too much, it'll be a lot of work to determine where you went wrong. And in fact, sometimes um, I'll find myself testing little bits of a calculation, you know, almost testing one term at a time, just to make sure I'm um, building on a solid foundation not building uh, castles in the sand. Um, let's look at two bullets. When somebody tells me they have a problem with their calcs, um, I sometimes sort of half jokingly say it's either calc order or it's block creation. Those are the two big problems that, you know, once you get past basic syntax, those are the two big problems. Um, block creation is pretty easy to test for. Um, you run a calc, you swear there should be a number there, but it's missing. Well, um, enter a, a dummy number like 99999, lock and send it, and then run the calc again. And if the number comes back with some reasonable number, it looks like it's been calculated, then you can be pretty sure that was block creation because you locked and sent the number and that created the block. And then when you ran the calc, the calc was able to uh, populate that block. If it uh, still comes back, um, uh, it, uh, with the same number, 
um, then it's or or with some completely erroneous number, then the problem was not block creation, or it may come come back with a, um, a missing number because the calculation is actually deleting uh, the data that you um, uh, locked and sent. So you know it may be that you're uh, doing a division and your numerator uh, or denominator doesn't exist. And so th those would be examples of why you might um, actually delete uh, the number that you previously locked and sent. In terms of calc order, it's much harder. Um, I don't think there's any way around this but to deeply memorize SBASE's order of calculation rules and uh, really become familiar with that. Um, the hardest calc problems are going to be thinking through calc order. You can also use set message detail. Um, set message detail will, will return a message in the log file, in the app log, uh, for every block touched in the order that they're touched. So that can give you some good diagnostics on uh, order of calculation. Never ever use set message detail in a production application or even a very large test application because it'll write a message for every block touch and that's very, very slow and will um, create very large uh, application logs. A, a couple of kind of a um, little, little bit less used things, um, the at return function. This will um, allow you to write messages that, for example, tell you which block you failed on or which member you failed on when a calculation fails. Now, it will fail. It, it's not something that you can use as a uh, uh, in-production uh, diagnostic, um, but it can be handy for figuring out where your calcs are failing um, in development. And um, Calc Manager Debugger, it's nice that we have a Calc Manager Debugger and it, it um, I had very high hopes for it and I, I haven't used it as, as much as um, I had hoped I would. Um, it, it's a little tricky to set up and get good results out of, um, but it, um, it can be very handy for tracing through calculations and uh, seeing how those numbers develop as you step through the calculation, which is a, a very valuable thing. Okay, different sheets. Uh, everybody's used these before. Um, I had an associate who referred to this as the book of zeros. The idea that um, you've got a control sheet with your correct, blessed, um, validated data on it. You've got a test sheet with the data that you're getting out of your um, test version of your um, database. And then you just do test minus control and you should get uh, all zeros. So um, that's why they call it the book of zeros. Um, so that's relatively simple stuff. So let's take it um, a couple of layers higher. So first, multi-grid. Uh, later versions of SmartView allow you to do multiple grids on the same page. Um, having the multiple grids on the same page is very important because then you can see the test and the control data and understand which ones, um, uh, understand what's wrong in the comparison between them. Uh, making them synchronized. I mentioned before that um, it's one thing to see that you've got a, a different sheet with a hundred zeros on it and one non-zero number. You say, well, it's mostly right, but there's this one error. It's another thing to know the source of that error. And in S-Base, in, in S-Base, we tend to test at the top and we know that the numbers originate, the errors, originated somewhere down in the granular levels of the database. 
So synchronizing your test and your control sheet so that you can drill down on them allows you to understand where the errors came from. And we'll look at some ways of synchronizing in a couple of minutes. Um, if I've got a plus 10 somewhere um, in the eastern U.S., minus 10 somewhere in the western U.S., those results are just going to cancel each other. So we have to avoid cancellation. And the one way we do that is to use absolute values, which essentially turns all the negative numbers into positive numbers, and it leaves the positive numbers as positive numbers. So now you reinforce your errors instead of canceling your errors. Now reinforcing is fine. We don't care so much the, the actual value of the error. We care that the error exists and where that error exists, what intersection it's um, resulting from. At that point, we care about the absolute value of it. But identifying where they are, absolute values help to avoid cancellation. Uh, comparing missing text. Simple answer, set smart view to return zero, and then at least your formulas will work out to zeros or a number. Um, but that doesn't really tell the true story because um, if it's missing in your test and present in your control, or if it's missing in your control and present in your test, you've got a meaningful error. So one of the things that I've done in in past in the more detailed tests, generally I just set them to zero and do the first layer of tests. Um, but I'll do formulas that say if it's missing on one side, give the, if it's missing on the control, put a C in the result. If it's missing on the test, give me a T in the result. If it's missing in both, of course, then it's equal and you wouldn't need the C or the T result. So you have to set up your if statements um, uh, accordingly. Um, using checksums. So we've got this um, uh, sheet of zeros and um, the bigger the sheet, the more thorough the test. So let's say we have a hundred columns by a thousand rows. We can't visually scan that with real reliability. So what you do is in the um, A1 cell, which is in S-based sheets, very uh, most of the time unoccupied, uh, put a checksum, sum up all of the errors. Um, and then you only have to look at one place to see the uh, essentially scan for any non-zero results. Use summary sheets. Now what happens when you get um, 10 or 20 or 30 um, different sheets in the same workbook. Um, again, it's hard to scan through all of those. So create a new sheet at the beginning of the book and use formulas to pull those checksums. So in a simple example, you'd have 30 rows, once for, one for each different sheet, and 30 formulas that just show the results of that checksum. And in SmartView, since we have uh, refresh all, um, uh, you could, so your, your partner says, I made some changes in the calcs yesterday, we need to do regression testing to see that nothing that was right before is broken. So you come in, you refresh all, you look at that summary sheet, and you should see a list of uh, zeros and uh, non, the non-zeros where any of those sheets changed and new things are broken. So there's nothing particularly sophisticated about any of this but building it up so that you've got these automated, um, quick procedures uh, allow you to get more testing done faster. Uh, I've often said that if testing isn't fast and easy, then we won't do it, or at a minimum, we won't do enough of it. Uh, using Excel data filters. So we've got this um, sheet with a thousand rows on it, and um, let's make it a little simpler. Let's just make it 12 months worth of columns. And we could have errors in any one of those months in any one of those 
thousand rows. How do we spot that quickly? Um, well, put a sum at the end. Now this isn't total year that you pulled from the SBASE database. This is sum of the 12 months that you created on the Excel worksheet. And then do a filter to filter any non-zero values, um, any non-zero rows, uh, any rows where that sum is non-zero. And then you've got a concise record of uh, each error. And by the way, you can then save this workbook, put a date stamp on it, and um, uh, maybe even uh, protect it. Um, and as you go through, um, you know, you send back some results, the calcs get corrected, you test them again the next day, so you've got um, a trail of workbooks as you did your testing. And this isn't pretty when uh, somebody says, uh, give me a log of all your testing, it's not really something that you can present in PowerPoints, but what you do have is if you have problems later, you do have a trail of how the testing was done. And, you know, maybe you could take that set of summary sheets and present it in uh, PowerPoints. So here's a um, uh, sort of a visual for uh, synchronizing different sheets. We need them synchronized. We need them synchronized so that we can drill down from higher levels where we see errors into the more granular levels so that we can see where those errors came from. So you know, maybe we have uh, uh, an error at total US and we drill down into individual states, and we've got 50 lines, and we see that three of them are wrong and the rest of them are right. Well, that narrows down where we have to look. So that's the idea. So um, here we've got a, a pivot table coming from a relational database with some uh, account names. Over here, we've got an S-base. Um, to the right, we've got an S-base view with those same account names, um, we can use formulas to read those account names from the pivot table sheet. So as we drill down in the pivot table, our um, S-base view corresponds to the drill down in the pivot table. And then we've got a difference, uh, we have a formula that looks over to the pivot table here then we've got a difference, so we can, and, and here's a checksum of this whole row, and here's some of the code that allows you to get there. Nothing magic about that code, but um, it's um, something you can use. Here's an example of counting the, um, the number of rows that have um, errors. Or, or no, in this case, this is just counting the rows, but we could do the same thing um, with a little bit different function um, to count the rows that have errors. So in this case, you see that uh, both the um, converted data and the import from PDCS had the same number of rows. This is a case where we're pulling in a text file, um, loading it to uh, PDCS, and when we pull that data back out, of PDCS, we want to make sure we got the same number of rows that we put in. Here's the checksum to make sure that the uh, the data value, um, in the checksum of course is nonsensical data, but it's a good check anyway. Here's um, an example of synchronizing using uh, smart view functions. Um, here's an HS get value. And um, here's how we would configure it to read the values in our, um, in this case, in, in the B column in the measures dimension and the markets dimension in the A column. And you could do this with more columns, and I've actually done this with 
five, six, seven columns, but it gets big and, and cumbersome. So it's just the same approach. Um, we're um, looking at the S base value here, the, the smart and query value here. We've got an HS get value here, and we just do the difference, and we can see where our errors are. And when we drill down, the same, we see the results of the next layer of granularity. So, well, east is already drilled down. Yeah, there we go. So, if, if we saw east, we could drill down to the states, and then we'd see that Florida is where that error is. Okay, um, pivot tables we can test from an Excel sheet, of course, but we can also test from flat files and we can test from relational databases. That's where, particularly relational databases, is where it becomes really valuable. The way we do that is we go to data, um, from text or from other sources, from other sources would give us the ability to pick a, um, a relational database. And um, we can actually, with um, MS Query, we can do some pretty powerful stuff there. We can actually do joins to other tables, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of depth and a lot of power uh, to that approach. Testing outlines. Um, the best thing to do is use the outline extractor. Um, I've had particularly good results with the new uh, next generation outline extractor that Applied OLAP um, um, provides. Um, that can be automated so it fits in well with regression testing and, and automating testing. So the idea is you extract um, your test version of the outline, you extract the control version of the outline, and then you, you compare them. And two good tools for doing line by line, letter by letter comparisons are a, a, there's a free tool called ExamDiff to let you compare item by uh, letter by letter um, files. And MS Word has a compare feature. Um, we go to View, Compare. It allows us to open two uh, Word documents and uh, compare line by line. Testing drill through. Um, I mentioned we um, created these macros to test thousands and thousands of results. Uh, we, there was a lot of change going on in the underlying um, GL aggregation database as they pulled um, new GLs in. So we, we tested this stuff repeatedly and um, we never could have done it uh, if we didn't have this, this macro. Here's the um, HYP get drill through reports and execute drill through reports. There's some examples of that code. If anybody's interested in more detail on that, I'll, I can send you some of the sample code that we used. Just email me. Uh, oh, by the way, my email address is rmore, that's R-M-O-O-R-E, at topdownconsulting.com. Uh, Trigger is another little used feature of um, uh, SBase. Triggers allow you to um, log a file or write a log file or send an email uh, based on certain conditions. So your condition might be um, um, uh, is sales the same as it was in the previous month? And if it's not, send an email. I had a great example of this a few years back. Um, we were doing a daily update of a financial reporting application and um, they restated data back several months. And um, what we wanted to know initially was um, at first, did the SBASE database actually calculate? So as soon as we had any new um, calculation results, uh, it would send an email to me and to the administrator. The more interesting thing was that there, there began to be a lot of um, questions about uh, why were earlier months changing. So 
uh, we were able to, to put some triggers that um, every morning would show differences between the previous couple of months and the, uh, we, we would save yesterday's version of the database, then create a new version of the database and do differences across those two, which is something I'll talk about in a minute, and um, send emails that log the differences between yesterday's version and today's version. And that brings us to the topic of difference cubes. Um, so I talk about kicking it up a notch with difference cubes. Well, if we can take a control worksheet with a certain set of, let's call them member names on it, and a test worksheet with an identical set of member names on it, and then I can take a third worksheet with the same set of member names and just test minus control onto that sheet and get every difference from one worksheet to the other. Can I take one S-base cube full of control data and another S-base cube full of test data, could I just subtract one from the other and get a complete set of differences? Well, let's look at a little theory here to begin with. Can I take um, this three-dimensional cube and load it to this two-dimensional cube? Well, yes, but I can only load one member of that third dimension. Now, looking over here, I just took one product and loaded it to this two-dimensional database. And let's just call that product three. Where's product? Where's the product dimension over here in the two-dimensional database? It's not there. So could I load data from this two-dimensional database to this three-dimensional database? Yeah, but I can only populate one member of the third dimension. So this is working with cubes of different numbers of dimensions. If I take a three-dimensional database and I flatten one dimension, I'll be down to two dimensions. If I take a two-dimensional database and I flatten one dimension, I'll be down to one dimension or a vector. If I take one dimension and I flatten it down, I'll be down to zero dimensions but I still have a point. A point has zero dimensions. So the relationship between an n-dimensional array and an n plus one dimensional array is as follows. Only one point from the n plus one dimension matches the n-dimensional array. So a single point does not require the dimension at all. Uh, example, a point on a sixth dimension is a five-dimensional array. So what we'll do is we'll, uh, so we start out with a control cube. So the example is I'm going to optimize this database. I don't want any of the numbers to change. I just want it to calc faster. So I take my control data and I freeze it. I make a copy of that cube and that becomes my test cube. I'm doing all my work now on my test cube. So my control cube's five dimensions and my test cube is exactly those same five dimensions. Um, I make a sixth, uh, uh, I make a, a, another copy of it and I add a sixth dimension. On that sixth dimension is a parent called diff and has two children, test with a plus consolidation property and control with a minus consolidation property. And diff is dynamic. I load, I export the five dimensional data from the test cube and I load it to the test member of the new dimension. 
How do I load it if it doesn't have test in there? Well, that's just a data load header. The other five dimensions are all the same. I just need to tell it in the data load header, load it to test. I load the control data to the control member of the new dimension. And then I have a difference on the third member. So now in person you can see that my nose grows like Pinocchio as I say this because this is a lie. Um, my third member is the difference of every single test number to every single control number. That's mostly true. Can anybody think of what the error is? Okay, now this is this is this is one of my favorite the errors. Um, think about the generation one intersection for the difference. Is that number the difference of the generation one intersection in test and the generation one intersection in control? And those generation one intersections are sums of all the data underneath. So is it the difference of the sums or on the other hand, in the difference member, have I added up all the differences um, below it? So is that number the sum of the differences? So it's a calc order issue. It's a valuable number, but the more valuable number is to first calculate the difference at level zero from the control cube to the test cube and then sum up all of those differences. And then you can drill down through the entire cube on your differences. Okay, sounds great, and it is um, when it's doable. Um, here's an example of um, the batch file that we would use to automate building of um, difference cubes. So uh, what's important here is um, that we set a variable for our control app name, set a variable for our um, control DB name, uh, test app, test DB, um, um, and um, where we're getting some of the data. And then we're going to call uh, the make diff cube um, maxl. And here's an example of that maxl. We won't go into details on that now, but you can, uh, and I'll send you copies of this if you're interested in them. And one thing we will need is a metadata file. Um, to build that sixth dimension. In this case, we didn't use an export and import. We used um, XREF, and the X makes those dynamic calcs. So we dynamically pulled the data from the source, uh, from the test and the control, and then we dynamically calculated the differences. Okay, limitations. What if you don't have the same members? Well, you're not going to be able to XREF uh, across different members. You can XREF across different dimensions. You can XREF all of the members that do match, and there'll be some glitches when the members don't match um, based on what happens with XREF not matching. But 90% of it will, be, will work. Um, you can, it, it's actually easier if you have different dimensions. That is, you have diff dimensions in one cube that you don't have in the other. You're just going to test one point at a time from the additional dimensions. Data volume and disk space. This is the big deal. Let's say I had a 50 gig control cube. So now I copy it for a 50 gig test cube. And then if I exchange data, if I export import, I've got 50 gigs of test, 50 gigs of control, and 50 gigs of difference. So that test, the diff cube is 150 gigs. So I've got 250 gigs of new data. That's non-trivial. So um, we want to do some things to reduce 
the data volumes. And basically we do that with um, dynamic uh, methods. Uh, calc order, the sum of the difference or the difference of the sums that I mentioned before. Uh, sometimes you'll get into situations where you make a copy, you got a lot of member formulas. You have to strip out those member formulas so that they're not overriding the difference calc. Um, a block creation, if you're doing this in completely dynamically, you're not going to create any blocks at all. So um, you have to address that. Um, version incompatibility. Um, long time ago I tried to do this like from version, you know, version 6 to version 7 uh, conversion with partitions and at least in that version you couldn't partition across um, uh, non-like versions. Of course you could x -ray. XREF has some limitations uh, compared to partitioning. So uh, design options. We can do export and import. That's the way that takes up the most space. Um, we can use partitioning, which is a better approach for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, partitioning is faster in most cases, uh, but it also has better different member, uh, unlike member behaviors. Uh, XREF, if you have the same dimensions but missing members on one side, it will give you the generation one number where for this purpose you'd probably like to see a missing, um, whereas partitioning will give you the missing. So XREF is a quicker solution than partitioning to build but uh, not as robust in the long run. Using dynamic calcs um, is a great uh, way to reduce data movement, but of course as it gets bigger, those queries get slower. Um, stored calcs, um, you know, and this is really a balance of what you store versus what you need dynamic. Um, you could put triggers into this difference queue uh, so that when your differences are non-zero, you get emails. And what I call the sweet spot design. So you're working on your test cube and you need that copy anyway because you can't um, do your changes on your production cube. So add your difference dimension to the test cube. All of the test data is already locally stored. You use a dynamic um, XREF to the control cube and then use a dynamic um, um, difference member. So you're not moving much data. You're, every time you query, you're pulling the control data and doing a dynamic calc um, for the difference. So that drastically minimizes the disk space uh, and is a good balance in most cases between um, ramping up disk space in order to have local uh, query times versus slowing down your query times with all dynamic uh, data transport. Okay, um, that's it. That brings me to uh, Q&A. Um, we've got a little bit of time left. I can go past the, the one o'clock if people are still interested. Um, do we have any questions? We don't have any questions so far, so just a reminder to people, if you have questions for Ron, just type them into the question box, and I will go ahead and read them off, and Ron can answer them. And Ron, I don't know if you have um, any standout questions from K-Scope that you can um, tell people that they've asked. That, and you responded to it, K-Scope, while we're waiting to see if we have any questions? Well, one of the questions that comes up um, about difference cubes, um, a lot of questions about difference cubes, and um, I've asked if they can be automated, and yes, they can absolutely be automated, and uh, you saw some of the um, uh, MaxL uh, and uh, batch file uh, to do that. Um, other questions about the theory behind it and um, 
it, it's one of those things that once you get it, it's not really very hard, but it seems bizarre when you first hear it. So, um, you know, go through the, the recording a couple times, um, email me if you want to uh, discuss it in person. Um, it, it'll get pretty easy to understand uh, pretty quickly. Then the, then the next step is um, deciding how to optimize building the difference cubes for your environment. And it really comes down to that trade-off behind, uh, 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 the trade-off um, around uh, export-import and having local query times versus um, doing it all dynamically and slowing down your query times and where the balance is um, in, in between. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any more questions and we're just about at the top of the hour. So. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining and uh, hope to see you at, at K-Scope and uh, hope to see you in my next webcast. Thanks, everyone.